Welcome to the C Word, the Conservatives podcast. Today we're talking about natural history. I'm Jenny Mathiason, an objects conservator based in South Yorkshire. And I'm Chloe Ramsey, an objects conservator based in Greater Manchester. And today we've got a special guest host with us, <gasps> Natalie Jones. Natalie, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Natalie Jones. I'm a natural history conservator based at the University Museum of Zoology in Cambridge. Avid listeners will remember you from an interview we did last season. At the in end our of road trip season. special. In yeah. our road trip special. Yeah, so exactly. welcome back to the Sea Word. Yeah. Thanks very much for joining us. <laughs> Slightly less stressed now that we've um, reopened. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different tone today. <laughs> it's less shell-shocked. <laughs> Yes, it was very much self-shocked the last time. So I thought we'd, before we launch into the natural history topic, I thought we'd just do some quick news. I just want to throw out there that Icon has a new CEO, which Hi. is uh, Sarah Crofts. So yeah, welcome Sarah to Icon. I like her already. I've seen her on Twitter and she tweets interesting things. Oh, good. <laughs> good. Um, there's also a new Emerging Professionals Network that's just launched as part of Icon, which is very exciting because, boy, do we need one. Uh, <laughs> so that's great. That's fantastic. I can't wait to see what comes out of that. Yeah. And then, hey. Oh, I have. I yeah. have. Well, OK, so it's not news. It's not like newsworthy, really. I submitted. I submitted an abstract to Icon. Well done. I did it. I said I might, and I actually did it. I actually submitted two because we're hoping to do something with the podcast as well. So it was just a slightly stressed yeah, you out worked hard. Um, <laughs> evening last week. I was like, I'm going to write all the things, and oh, is this professional enough? So yeah, uh, I so sort of now. really, Ooh. really, really want it, and really don't want it. At the oh, same yeah. time. Oh, the familiar feeling of angst of hooray and no oh god what have i done exactly oh now it's gonna be fine so fingers crossed yes. everything's fine good luck good luck and Thanks. good luck to everyone out there who submitted good something luck. because apparently they had record numbers did of, they of people oh, yeah like more that. than ever oh my god so i mean good luck people trying to sift yeah. that down and oh great um, news though for yeah. um conservation community interaction absolutely so awesome. hopefully loads and loads and loads of good talks to look forward to so yeah, that's jolly exciting. And you may have seen, if you get the lovely Michael Nell's emails, that the next Icon AGM is going to feature us. We'll be there. We'll be there. We'll do a thing. We're hosting. It's going to be lovely. Conversation on diversity. And if you're not um, there in person, you can tune in in some other fashion. Exactly. We're going to be fine. Uh, it's going to be great. It's going to be really good. It's going to be scary. We're going to talk but, diversity and stuff like that. So yeah. it's going to be really, really good. Yeah, we've really got good. Um, some great speakers on diversity joining us. Yes, we'll bring our audio engineer Fox along as well. So it's going to be great. You get to see us all for real seas if you're there. Um, anyway, uh, natural history, eh? Well, yeah, I'm really excited about this one because um, I've always sort of looked at Natalie's work. when we, we So we worked together for a short while um, in Cambridge with Natalie. And I was always slightly in awe. Yeah, Natalie, how did you actually get started in, with natural history conservation? Well, it was quite random. I uh, randomly, I did my BA in architecture. Ooh, and I didn't I, know that. Like, growing up, I was like convinced I, I want to be an architect. So I went to Lincoln University and I started the BA in architecture and then decided this is really not for me. Like, I, I don't like it at all. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and after the BA, I had no idea what I wanted to do. So I went traveling. And then when I got back from traveling, I was flipping, um, like, you know, flicking through a prospectus because... Mm. And I came across conservation at the at the University of Lincoln again, and it's not. It was something I hadn't ever heard of. I didn't realise it was a job that you could do, and it grabbed my interest. So I transferred and went on to the graduate diploma, and then did the the masters at Lincoln. And the Lincoln course, like it's great. It's quite general, like objects conservation. So mm -hmm. you learn a little bit of everything. We didn't actually do anything natural history. Like we were doing lots of ceramic, lots of gilding, yeah, lots of um, like leather or. Sounds very familiar to a lot of people I think mm. yeah I think it was the it was the year I was graduating and I saw like a job advert for it was um, a cloth workers internship in the okay. conservation taxidermy mm -hmm. oh. and I was like oh wow that sounds amazing and I was very lucky in that I was successful in applying for that job and I spent a year at the Horniman Museum learning all about conservation of natural history and um, from there I was like 
this is it. I, I love natural history conservation. Oh, it can never be overstated how important those sorts of opportunities are in sort of shaping, shaping us as conservators. That's really, yeah. really cool. Yeah, I think doing the course, because it was so general, it's not so, natural history wasn't something I'd considered, but mm. my favourite museums to go and visit are natural history museums. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, so, yeah, when that opportunity arose, like it was just like, yeah, this is... This is the dream. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I imagine now you're in the industry. Do you have any sort of extra extra knowledge about how to get into the subject and what would be helpful? Well, I think there's more opportunities now than there were a couple of years ago. I think natural history, it's becoming more popular or it's becoming um, more as known about it, I suppose. So there's more, mm-hmm. slightly more job opportunities, I'd say, coming up um, than there previously were. And I think there's more, I suppose, publicity around it. You know, Natsuka are very supportive. Um, So Natsuka is the Natural Sciences Collections Association, um, for those people who don't know. And I think it's just becoming more of a a talked about speciality. Yeah. Um, yeah. um, I think people are recognising that perhaps there has been like a lull in training and focus on that speciality and have recognised that. And I think for when the internship opportunity came up for me I think that was when you know our funding bodies recognized that there was a need to support that speciality so ICON and the Cloth Workers um, Foundation have been supporting internships in natural history conservation and I think since then there's been more support and more recognition of it being um, a speciality and not just a a, a subsection of perhaps objects or mm-hmm. um, ethno anthropology conservation. So, do you think anything changed in particular that sparked that off? Was it so? I know that there have been quite a few. Um, sort of bids for renovation bids for um for re-storage and re-display in recent years your museum in particular there's manchester museum so was there something that happened that made people realize or do you think maybe it was a maybe people just thought oh this is quite out of hand so we need to sort it out (laughs) yeah um i'm not sure i don't know whether it was just coincidence that those like the redevelopments and yeah um, the recognition of that happened at the same time, or I'm not sure to be honest, but I think the redevelopment of a couple of natural history museums, I think, has definitely highlighted mm-hmm. the need for a subject specialism in natural history and supporting the training of that. Um, and I think there's definitely, you know, there's a couple of training courses um, outside of university that you can do short courses. Yeah, I, I don't know whether there was something particular that happened or whether it's all just come about because those collections have like been perhaps neglected over Mm -hmm. the years yeah yeah because I have to say I feel like for a while natural history wasn't considered very sexy like it it was like kind of old hat and it got tucked away yeah and now I feel like yeah but now I feel like that's a huge revival Mm -hmm. people suddenly you know they realize this is a huge thing and that visitors of any age actually really enjoy them and that it's a hugely engaging thing so now I feel like people are taking their taxidermy back out and going oh my god we have taxidermy this is great let's use Mm -hmm. it I think there's a real revival in the whole museum sector just appreciating natural history you know beyond the specialist museums like even you know like little museums that happen to have a bit of taxidermy seem to be like really into it now which I think is fantastic it's so nice to see because you know natural history stuff is really important and often really either beautiful or thought-provoking yeah do you think we're thinking about um the natural world in a different way now because uh, so I, I think I'm coming from this question from the point of view of did we say in the 80s and think in the 80s and 90s that taxidermy and say you know animal heads and stuff was just old-fashioned and cliched and stuff no yeah, possibly yeah people perhaps had the the tendency to think it was old fashioned or it's very Victorian yeah. and it, yeah. you know, identify with it. And perhaps I think what you are perhaps ain't going towards is like, you know, you know, you've got all these programs on the TV now, like planet earth two and, and yeah. all of that. And I think mm-hmm. oh, people yeah. are connecting with um, the natural world a little bit more mm-hmm. than perhaps previously. And, you know, coming into a natural history museum where you can get so up close and personal with you know animals that you 
aren't necessarily going to have the chance to see in the wild. I think, yeah, perhaps people are thinking about it in a different way. We've just had um, a summer exhibition at the Museum of Zoology on taxidermy. So it is the work of Jack Fishwick, who is one of, you know, the UK's leading taxidermists. And his work is amazing. And, um, you know, if you look at it, it's, it's hard not to see that bird as as alive and his the quality of his work is just phenomenal and that was such a popular exhibition it just goes to show that there is a public interest in it and people really do like and appreciate taxidermy yeah Um, absolutely i feel like people have interesting reactions to taxidermy which i enjoy because uh we recently tried to display more taxidermy at the museum i'm at and it was a mixture of loans and our own collections. Um, and basically we did like a little habitat section of like what it would have been like when, you know, it was, it was all snow around here, that sort of thing. People's reactions were really funny and lovely to me because some people went, ooh, and kids especially loved it. Like, mm-hmm. oh my God, animals. And then you got people who were like, oh, that's gross and weird. Yeah. But at the same time, <laughs> it's not like anyone was unmoved. It wasn't something mm-hmm. that people just went by and didn't look at. Everyone stopped and looked and everyone had a reaction you know it was you got all sorts which was really nice and I think it worked really well yeah I think with our exhibition as well I think we had some really strong reactions like mostly overwhelmingly positive but you know you did have that one like a handful of reactions where people and we had a visitors book to so people could record comments but I just remember one comment saying this is outrageous this is awful and um yeah, and it just goes to show, I think, people have very strong reactions to taxidermy. Mm. And for our exhibition, like I said, overwhelmingly positive, but this one stands out in my mind because it was so negative. But I think people perhaps still have that negative reaction, perhaps because they don't realise where the birds had come from. So I think mm. for this person, they thought everything had been killed for the exhibition, which isn't true. And I think that just goes to show that we perhaps have to educate people to, you know, to make sure that they are aware that nothing is, you know, harmed. And I think you you will get that kind of reaction, even in not just specific to this exhibition, but generally in natural history museums, Mm. you'll have that one or two reactions where people think something has been killed for display they don't necessarily realise that perhaps most of our specimens are up to 100 years old and mm, yeah. we don't collect like we used to. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we, we are much more of a, <laughs> we protect our wildlife and there's yeah. so many laws governing that type of behaviour now. So, but I still think, you know, you, there's still that reaction there sometimes. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I've been throwing around the word natural history, but and we're talking about taxidermy quite a lot. But natural history can, of course, mean a lot of different things. We haven't done our definition section yet. <laughs> <laughs> Do love a definition. Um, and anyway, like natural history or natural science collections can, of course, obviously include taxidermy. Duh. Also includes uh, entomology. So that's, you know, bugs and crawly things and beautiful butterflies and all that stuff. And then botany, geology and paleontology. So pretty rocks and all sorts and sometimes not very pretty rocks, let's be fair. <laughs> no, I, I've peeked in my geology collection and some of it's very grey. Um, <laughs> and then and then also fluid collections. So fluid specimens or spirit specimens, which people have very strong emotions regarding. And they seem to be much more knee jerky than the taxidermy reactions. Uh-huh. I mean, it depends on what you're looking at. Like, you know, it, it depends on what's being pickled. <laughs> but... It, it can be a mixed bag. <laughs> people people can be very grossed out by it or very intrigued by it. So that's uh, almost more polarising, I feel. I think definitely. I think um, in a previous museum I've worked in, when we used to have visitors into the lab, um, we'd always, if we had like wet collections in the lab, we'd put them to one side and, you know, warn people <laughs> just to let you know there's, we have fluid specimens here um, because there is that knee-jerk reaction. What what do we mean by ick factor in that respect? What is it, do you think, that freaks people out? Is it the wetness? I think so. for some people it might be the wetness or the worry about what the fluid is. Right, yeah, okay. So I think some people have that reaction. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, and obviously there are health and safety concerns with the fluid yeah. and stuff, like depending on what it is and all that. But for some reason, I think it's just grossness uh, <laughs> that's in fluid. Yeah. Much like some people don't like pickled things because they're bobbing around in a jar. <laughs> I think you can have the same reaction to something that's not a vegetable. But for some people, it's about all about what the contents is. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, you put a bird in a jar. That's not right. Mm-hmm. Or, I mean, especially if it's like something uh, fetal. So, you know, yeah. some of that, then that's very disturbing to some people. <laughs> Uh, which you know we just have to understand and like be okay with Mm -hmm. like i'm pretty tough skinned so i just kind of like them (laughs) (laughs) i just kind of universally like them i'm kind of okay with them (laughs) i really like them i don't know what it is about them but they're one of my favorite types of collections to work on i don't have like you know the, the ick factor or anything i just find them really fascinating I suppose that's what I find interesting about other people's reactions when, like, you know, they really don't like them. And I'm like, why? Because they're amazing. I think they're really cool. So yeah, I'm so. really, I think the, the only ick factor for me is to start with this, the spiders. If the spider's in a jar, I can't do it. Okay. Because of the way that they float around. Fortunately, there's not very many spiders in jars. N- no, apart from all the ones we had to decant. <laughs> Yeah, okay <laughs> at your museum natalie <laughs> i'm with chloe i really i am not a fan of spiders and i feel really bad saying that because i'm a natural history conservator so i should <laughs> like i should like at all of them but spiders are the one thing that really do creep me out and i've got quite a few big spiders in the lab at the moment and oh no oh. I obviously have to work on them and I do work on them, but they're not my favourite things to work on. How do you, so how do you do it? So I'm, uh, context, I really, 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 really hate spiders so much so that even dead spiders can't deal with it. I just have to go, and, like pest traps yeah. are a nightmare for me. Um, oh, I hate the pest traps when they've got spiders on. I will throw them across. I am the person everyone fetches to deal with the pest traps because I don't mind spiders. Oh. Well, I have lit- I have little special litter pickers that I use and I have a whole system to get around it. Anyway. Oh my god. Um, how do you do it? How so how do you get over that phobia when it's just lying there and it's all ugh. Um <laughs> I, I guess it's because I have to. Right. There's no I don't have anybody else to delegate it to. Oh, <laughs> that's such you a know, good that, answer. That's, good that's answer. the thing. <laughs> because if I had, I'd definitely delegate that at the moment i've got a camel spider which if you google an image of a camel spider they're really hairy and they're really Mm. big and i've got another spider two other spiders one's a tarantula Mm. the other i'm not sure what it is but they're bigger than my hand no no. so Mm -mm. i tend to that's funny (laughs) the bigger they are the less i I mind them i I find myself holding my breath quite a lot of the time oh hey Um, okay so, yeah. Uh, and are they wet specimens or dry specimens then? Well, the wet specimens, I don't find them as creepy. Um, okay. Is it because they're contained? <laughs> yeah, I think they're contained. Yeah. The dry spiders or the non-wet specimens, I guess they look so alive. I think that's where the fear is. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I surprised myself by being incredibly freaked out recently because we were installing an exhibition in which we'd agreed that we would pin loads of large butterflies up on like a back panel Mm -hmm. it would look really fantastic i'd never actually touched these before and i thought this is going to be fine and as it turns out i'm incredibly phobic of very large insects and touching them and i've never been that distressed i think in a display case of trying to pin up (laughs) is that because of the damage because i think i i'm frightened of handling butterflies for example because i don't want to hurt them is it no. is there a damage element to it? No. It's the sheer size. Oh. Somehow that's just. <laughs> I feel like it's gonna fly in my face. And I know it's dead, but it's, I was like, yeah. I don't. I think no, it's I feel the exactly size. the same. It's and uh, I think it's the freaky. number of legs. There's too many legs. Mm, mm. Okay. There's a lot going on, and I I was surprised because it was a completely irrational fear. Right, it's dead, and I will definitely do more damage to it than it can possibly ever do to me, given that it's dead. Um, and somehow that was terrifying just touching these giant butterflies and being really close to them and I had to take my gloves off because otherwise I couldn't pick the pin up properly and Uh ah, ah." I was really freaked out (laughs) like a lot (laughs) but there's only me to do it so (laughs) I had to tough it out (laughs) 
<laughs> so can we talk about the specific conservation in these terms? And I feel like this yeah. is a good uh, springing off point because there's loads. Of, I have loads of questions of this. I think I saw like a snippet of the kind of work you do, Natalie, in the um, really great, great Twitter conference, Icon Twitter conference last year. Mm. Was it last year? Mm-hmm. This year, last year. Um, so how do you go about conserving the super tiny little legs on things? Because I feel like I've seen some <laughs> magic worked and it just it's on such a tiny, literally fall apart scale that I, I, I just don't have a concept of it. <laughs> It's definitely how long you can hold your breath for with the small things. Right. Um, Because they're so delicate and so fiddly that just, yeah, that exhale of your breath and, you know, you've lost it all. (laughs) Oh, my God. Um, I don't know. I find it quite challenging, but I enjoy that challenge um, just as much as I like working on the really big things. So that's for insects. Um, (laughs) And is it the same for wet specimens then, if you have to remove them from the fluid in order to stick them back together? To a certain extent, yes, it's the same technique. Um, It's just using different adhesives. Mm -hmm. Um, So for fluid specimens, obviously you need something that's not going to dissolve or react (laughs) Uh with the alcohol. Yeah. Or, or, you know, whatever the fluid medium is. But yes, it's exactly the same technique. I think with, you know, insects in fluid, they're generally a little bit in a better condition because they tend to be in a test tube within a great, like, you know, within a bigger jar. Mm -hmm. So, and they've got the fluid supporting them as well. So they tend to be that little bit better maintained than dried insect collections. Um, For spiders, I'm thinking about seeing a spiders as a theme. Yeah, but I I think it works both ways. I think some of the, our insect collections especially, are better maintained in fluid. This is training that I've never done myself. So I've seen other people go on training and I've heard people go, oh, that was really good. But I've never... I haven't done any fluid specimen training yet. I would love to because we have... Oh, you definitely said that it's the best kind of training. (laughs) And um, it tends to be like, you know, once you've got the technique of um, fluid specimens, like Mm. it's the same technique over and over and over again. Mm. It doesn't really change. So once you've got that initial level of training and, you know, once you've worked with the collections a a bit, you'll find that, you know, it's it's the same technique over and over again. Mm -hmm. Mm. So my problem with... I'm fine with wet specimens, really. And I'm even, even fine with like you know, the stuff that people get upset with. For me, it's the smell of it that I can't, I just can't do with it because I've got a really strong sense of smell. Oh. Um, and so even when I was... I like the smell. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, when, I mean, we, we all remember we were all working together on yeah, Spirit yeah. Store decant. Yeah. And I was in but full mask because I thought, yeah. I knew I was going to, I was going to sensitize if I didn't wear a full mask. So I was in, I was, you know, eccentrically masked up. Yeah. Anyway, so but that was you, off topic. But basically, if you always had a more sensitive uh, sense of smell, then yeah. you, you would all, always have been more susceptible to that sort of thing. Yeah, anyway, yeah, right? yeah. And yeah, naphthalene, so. oh my God, that's whole different oh naphthalene sucks yeah (laughs) sorry oh i love the smell of naphthalene i know you do it's really so weird (laughs) (laughs) the bit that got me during the during the zoology zoo work with you is uh when i got home and found that my bra smelled like naphthalene (laughs) like what where is this where's this coming from (laughs) Uh, right sorry back on the subject of conservation you're quite right So on the Twitter conference, Natalie, the bit of conservation that really blew my mind, and I don't know why, but it just completely blew my mind, was your work on infills for furry creatures, basically mammal taxidermy. And I was just amazed, absolutely amazed. Can you describe what you did just for our listeners? So that is needle felting. Um, and Amazing. I spoke about it very briefly in the, the Twitter conference last year, but I've also just recently spoken about it at the, the NASCAR f- conference, cool. which was Oxford, was it two or three weeks ago now? Yeah, <laughs> I really want to oh, try it. It was a technique that um, I picked up when I was working at the Horniman uh, Museum. And a colleague of mine there, was she was a keen needle felter, and she used to make these like faux taxidermy little um, animals. It's, yeah, it's a technique I've never heard about. I am um, perhaps, I, like, I, I don't like sewing. I don't like needle felting or that type of thing. It's not a craft or a hobby that I enjoy outside of work. But I happen to be um, working on a project where... I was investigating different methods of fills for like areas of loss on taxidermy and her work. Um, so this is Laura at the Horniman Museum. 
it got me thinking it's like oh this could be an interesting technique to use and so I started playing around with it I found a couple of papers on it that had been um some people at the National Museum of American Indian NMAI and I'd seen that they'd published a paper on using it for an area of loss on this uh, trim so I thought I'll give it a go and um and I got like you know I, I was trying it and it gave such immediate and good results. Um, I just started playing around with it. And so since then, that was 2012. So it's just a technique that I've just been playing around with for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. And then moving to the Museum of Zoology, where we <laughs> perhaps unfortunately, um, or luckily for me, <laughs> had really pest damage taxidermy. And, you know, when you've got pest damage on taxidermy, especially to the extent that we had, there was like, we had a red panda, um, we had an eye eye, and there was barely any hair left on these things. Yeah. Thanks to moth. And it's just like, what do you do? Because I think the whole point of taxidermy within natural history museums is to kind of represent what that animal would look like in the wild yeah and in the wild like you know they're not going to be bald <laughs> no that yeah, be very they important. do look yeah. definitely very feet, patchy building. don't they as mm. soon as there's yeah. any damage they look bad mm. it's such an easy technique to learn and you know it's so reversible and um you can adapt the colors and like the depth of the the hair um, I spoke about it a little bit more in depth at the recent Natsuka Conservation Conference. I I was really impressed with it because bit, bit spoilers, but I, I I was there as well. Uh, <laughs> and um, essentially, I mean, what I really loved was that you don't have to use adhesives to attach it because of the yeah. the weird Velcro like furriness on the back of what you're felting it means that you can just place it on the specimen and it's oh, held wow. in place by friction. Uh, which confused a lot of people because you get a lot of questions about it, Natalie. And, uh, and I was like, it no, I can totally see it. It just kind of hooks on, like it just nestles in. It's amazing. And also I like that you uh, suggested that if you had some spare fur, because let's be fair, some things shed. Yeah. And yeah. we mm. collect it because we're nuts. Uh, <laughs> then if you have some that matches, then you could put some Integrate. into your felting That's so, so cool. that it looks even more natural uh, of course bearing in mind that you do need to record it properly so that you know yeah. people know and all that but obviously we're doing that anyway so duh but yeah i i just love the technique and uh, i really want to try it it's I, elegant it's an elegant solution yeah, i it's really, really want to nice. go and try some yeah but uh, there, there were loads of good there were loads of good things at that conference actually like another lady spoke about uh, making japanese tissue fills not just for fur but for feathers and i immediately oh, what? oh yeah and i immediately went away and tried it and i don't think i ever want to put down my japanese tissue again because it's amazing <laughs> and uh, yeah i was just really into that yeah it, it, there were some amazing things just mm-hmm. going on at that conference yeah it was, it was, it was a great conference there's yeah. a lot of good talks there yeah, it was the first conservation one, so we're hoping for many more. Because oh, that was I really missed cool. out. I missed out. Next time. Jo- Are there any other skills, Good actually, um, extra skills, Natalie, that you've um, either heard of or had to pick up whilst in the field? Well, I tend to try and attend as many you know, external short courses as I can. And I think for natural history, because you're working on such a diverse range of materials, there's so many short courses that you can attend. So, for example, I've attended short courses on on taxidermy how to do taxidermy cool um i've been on leather conservation courses been on this year i went to a skeletal preparation course (laughs) so yeah there's like lots of random courses that you can do which i think you can get so many transferable skills that you can take to your workplace and adapt to you know what you're working on that's really inspiring so I think now uh, will be a good time to listen to an interview that we have with another natural history conservator. So today we're talking about natural history and I'm here with Lucy. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a bit about what you do? Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm Lucy Mascord and I'm an accredited conservator of natural history. I work freelance and I also work for Lancashire County Council Museum Service. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm an icon trustee and I'm also the conservation representative on the Natsuka Committee and Natsuka are the Natural Sciences Collections Association, a specialist subject network. What made you get into natural history in particular? 
Well, it kind of found me, to be honest. Um, I didn't know about conservation until uh, after I had studied at university and I studied human anatomy. Uh And I started volunteering in the museum at my university, which is the Victoria Gallery Museum at the University of Liverpool. Uh They had a zoology collection and basically none of their volunteers wanted to go near it. Nobody was interested in all of this um it it was a wet collection specifically so it's you know um it's slightly scary material some might think yeah so it kind of found me and I am I'm just extremely interested in anatomy and animals and it just all fitted and I wanted a job that was practical then I started to create my own route into it really Uh, which is what many people who want to specialise in natural history find they have to do because there isn't any formal route to take. So Yeah, no, I've noticed that. And it's not really something that I find is covered much in, you know, the training programmes that we have available to us. So in in actual fact, I I was going to ask if you have any advice to people out there who want to start with natural history conservation but they're not sure how to get the skills and the knowledge like what 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 can you do yeah i i think it's extremely difficult i think it's i mean firstly conservation is extremely difficult to get into to find a job in to be successful in never mind finding a specialism you're correct it's not particularly taught at universities you probably have to um if you're having a work placement you would have to request it be in a natural history museum Mm. uh, setting with a zoology collection and but even then you're not you you may be getting three months to a year and that's not not particularly long to specialize in a subject there's lots of courses out there um well I say lots there's actually quite a few uh, only a few courses but you just have to keep your eyes open Mm. I mean obviously if you're a member of ICON you may see things come through it's also useful to be a member of NATSCA or if you don't want to be a member then join up to the NATSCA JISC mail list because everyone shares the training courses that are available in that and they can definitely help you and 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 let you know whether it's right for you if it's a good fit for you and people are always welcome to contact me contact NATSCA and uh, learn a little bit more about it and I think that's a good start but I won't lie and say it's easy it's it's definitely not there's not many jobs out there so Although I must say natural history is one of those collections that's oddly underrated and yet a lot of museums out there have some. So actually the objects are certainly out there to work on. It might just be that it's not a, it might not be a dedicated job in it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, all collections have some natural history and natural history, it's a little bit of a Marmite subject. (laughs) Some people really dislike it. Some people love it. It's incredibly appealing to children um, and young people and Families love to visit natural history galleries. So it's important that museums look after their collections. But they have been, you know, a lot of museums might push them aside slightly because they don't know what to do with them. They're often not our high value objects. So they're not cared for as much. And people don't value spending money on conservation Mm. on these types of objects as well. But that's why it's very important that even if you're not a specialist in natural history conservation, that all conservators out there at least know how to approach an object, even if they're not going to carry out the conservation themselves. It's important that they understand the issues that that can happen with the incredible breadth of materials that can come under natural history. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I'm very grateful that I managed to get some training in it because we have a natural history collection, you know, much like any local authority museum does. And I I was initially terrified, you know, when I started my job and I was like, I have no idea what to do with natural history. And that's where training really helped solidify just some basic skills so that I feel like Mm. I'm no longer terrified of it and it gives you a couple of of people that you can just talk to about it so that you you know who to go to when you're like oh my god someone's beak fell off what do I do now 
Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing, like even just having a network there to speak to is really important and valuable. I think one of the things that you that you said there about it being a bit scary as well, I think mm. there's a lot of really negative information put out there about natural history collections, particularly taxidermy, that puts people off even touching things. And that isn't the case. You know, it's very similar to any other type of collection. If you wear your nit- nitrile gloves, you take reasonable risks then you're absolutely safe. So it's important to to get that information out there so people aren't scared. Obviously, as we've just been talking about, natural history conservation can be unusual and uh, you're you know, clearly familiar with the ick factor that kind of comes with it. Are there any types of specimens that you find challenging to work with or like, either now or when you first got started? Well, I think because my background is in human anatomy, I have a very high threshold yeah, for strong what's challenging, <laughs> to be honest. And uh, I have the ability to, to disconnect to some extent from what I'm doing. Mm. And I... What, my first job was with the Royal College of Surgeons in London. And I, I think the fetal specimens are the, are the difficult ones. Mm. Um, nowadays, I'm, I'm working nearly always with animal specimens instead of instead of human remains. Yeah. And um, I know I'm kind of OK with everything. I don't really like big, scary hornets or oh. spiders, oh, but I yeah. can manage them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you have a favourite object or specimen that you've ever worked on? I really enjoy working with mammals. I always have because um, the anatomy is more closely associated with the human anatomy. Mm. Um, I really enjoy working on the things that you don't see very often. So echidnas, I love echidnas. Uh, I've got a Tasmanian devil that I've really enjoyed working on. Before I worked in as a natural history conservator I didn't know that much about birds but it's really helped me to learn a lot about birds and I really enjoy working with some of our more interesting species like capcaillie or great busted um, they, they're some of my favorites to work on yeah so we talked a bit about Natska would you perhaps tell us a little bit more about the organization yeah, so um, Natska, I repeat again, is the Natural Science Collections Association, and they're a subject specialist network. And the, most people out there probably noticed that ICON doesn't have a, a natural history group uh-huh. or anything like that. The conservation side is wrapped up under Natska, but they also support curators researchers, lots of people who are working with collections and lots of people who are working with mixed collections who, as we've already said, might just happen to have some natural history under there. So they're a really fantastic, active network, really dynamic, and they put lots of resources out there to help people look after their collections, curate their collections, interpret their collections. I came into the role as conservation representative in 2017. Sorry, I'm trying to think what year it is. (laughs) Um, And um, at that point, I decided to start a group of natural history conservators because I didn't want to be a spokesperson without speaking to my peers. So we've we started a group, a working group on Donatska, and um, our first move is to have this conference about caring for collections, basically to put ourselves out there and tell people we're here and we're doing this and we can support you and we can share information with you and you can share information with us. Because for a while now, the conservation side of it has been in in the background. So we're, we're just kind of waving now and letting people know we're here and trying to think of ways that we can support people and support the sector. And the best way to do that, I think, is to put ourselves out there and ask people. That's fabulous. That sounds great. So uh, it's definitely worthwhile for Conservatives to join Natska then? Yeah, I think so. Um, If you have some type of natural history collection, you'll get a lot out of it. You can go onto the website and nothing is, is locked up or anything. So all of their publications are up there. There's lots of resources about caring for collections. And we hope to continue that, add more and update things as we go. Also, if you're a member, and it's a very uh, cheap membership, I, I must say, for all of the good work that we do. Um, if you are a member, then you get discounted prices to our conferences and all of our events and all of our training. Oh, that sounds fabulous. Excellent. Um, I look forward to reporting back from the conference as well. 
Uh, is there anything else that you would like to add about natural history and your journey? No, I don't think so. I think just reiterating what I've said already that, um, you know, don't be scared of your collections. And um, there are specialists out there. Sometimes I think sometimes people think that there aren't specialists in natural history. So, um, and, um, you know, we're all friendly and approachable. So ask if you need any help and, and, and we'll help you where we can. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Lucy, for talking to us today. I think something that I really enjoyed taking away from that was the enjoyment aspect of it, that it's like working with natural history can be really enjoy- enjoyable for like conservators and like mm-hmm. learning new things and discovering new things. And then also for visitors, obviously, because yeah. visitors really enjoy it and especially families, like you mentioned. But yeah, I, I think there's a great deal of enjoyment in just working with taxidermy. And I know that makes me sound like a crazy person, <laughs> but... I love working with taxidermy. I think this is something I like birds just in general. Yeah. And I love having nothing cheers me up like having a bird on the table in front of me. Just like, <laughs> oh, look at his little face. I don't know. I, I think I get really into my animals. So I'm definitely a crazy person. And then I love the like expressive taxidermy of mammals as well, which I think is really, really fun. Mm-hmm. I think the one thing I don't, I'm not really into is fish. I don't really like fish taxidermy. I find fish a bit weird. <laughs> I think it's it's interesting how people working with different natural history collections, they are kind of drawn to the different types of collections. So I think Lucy was saying that she was, you know, one of her favourite types of collections to work on was the mammals. Yeah. Um, Jenny, you were just saying you really like the birds. I love the birds as well. I find them perhaps the most challenging to conserve because you've got everything that's going on with the feathers. Yeah. And... This, it's so much and also they have teeny tiny complex. eyes so if you have to repl- replace an eye it's very fiddly <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, I just there's something about the birds I, I'm really drawn to them mm. and I find them really challenging and I really enjoy conserving them I love working on the mammals as well and it's so different to working on hair as it is to working on feathers yeah it's 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 funny what people are you know drawn to within within natural history collections um and like i was saying earlier i love working on the fluid specimens as well so i enjoy birds but i don't necessarily know nearly enough about them mm-hmm. or if i do then i don't know enough about their uk habitat or you know like because mm-hmm. I, I come from somewhere else so um and then i find it really fascinating to be learning all these things because i mean you don't always have time because you know we're under great time pressures and things tend to be done for exhibitions but if you yeah. do have time to go away and read about something and like even if it's just something like making the little mountains on look a little bit more natural you might be thinking about well, what would it be sitting mm-hmm. on and you know what kind of moss would be growing on that rock you know <laughs> i don't know you can get really into it and you can learn so much uh, and it can be little things and eventually you come away with more knowledge because mm-hmm. that's the thing right i'm i'm an objects conservator that's really into uh natural history and taxidermy but i wouldn't call myself a natural history conservator just because i feel like i'm too much of a dummy like i don't know enough i i don't have all this vast knowledge like because i look at natural history creators in awe because they are super duper experts yeah and like they are you know biologists and all this stuff and i'm like well i I just just so much to know i just know the birds in my garden and then some ducks (laughs) (laughs) i think um well listening to Last week's podcast, when you were talking about military history, and oh, yeah. you were talking about the different terminology um, that you use, mm. and like it's the same with natural history. It's like the terminology that you'd use, like when it comes to doing your condition reporting, when you're talking specifically about a certain bone on a skeleton. Yeah, mm-hmm. like you can't just say like bone on the left. Like you end up saying like the left tibia or something. Yeah. So you end up learning as you're going. The more and more you do it, mm. you're learning more and more about anatomy. And it's not something I would have necessarily, you know, back when I was at university training to be a conservator, I wouldn't have even considered learning about anatomy. (laughs) But the more I'm doing it, the more I'm picking up and the more you're working on, like whether it's birds or mammals, and then you're then picking up the scientific names. So you're describing, I don't know, like a pika pika, which is a magpie. And then I end up saying these things. It's like, when did I learn that was the scientific name for a magpie? (laughs) You don't even remember, you just absorbed it. (laughs) (laughs) that's so cool um, 
it's funny how you pick up so many other skills that you might not have necessarily realized was yeah. related to natural history conservation that's so cool I'm, i feel like a lot of so i work in a uh, currently though i have worked in say ethnographic collections before i work in at the moment quite modern collections and textiles social history right? yeah social yeah. history but I did used to be an archaeologist and I used to be mm-hmm. able to identify all of the bones in the body of all mammals. Um, oh. And so that, <laughs> when you said that, oh, describing the left tibia, I was thinking, yeah, yeah, I could do that. But then literally everything else, I think, oh, God, yeah, I, I don't know how I would. It's just so I would. There's a lot to know. There's a lot to learn, isn't there? But it sounds like yeah. it's something that you kind of because you're, you you learn it gradually and you specialise gradually, um, it's just a general, it's a, a sort of um, gentle building of knowledge rather than now memorise how to, you know, describe all of the birds in the... We have, um, in our lab, we've got crib sheets. Oh, of, like, great. Oh, nice. Anatomy, anatomy, mammal anatomy. So any, like, internships or interns or work placement students we get in, it's like, here are the crib sheets. Like, you're not, you know, you're not expected to know this coming straight out of university. It's just something you pick up. And, oh, like, I still use, like, I, I haven't got, like, you know, um, a map of a mammal skeleton in my head. I, like, I still have to refer to the crib sheets. But I think it's useful to have those absolutely i want to take that crib sheet idea away and make one for my own museum because there's loads of well like, yeah you can the, with that's a useful th- yeah. resource for many collections yeah that's the thing yeah especially mm. when you've got a lot of one type of thing yeah that's really cool yeah right, i'm gonna do that yeah. i think like you know, not just the bones of the body it's like you know the the wings in a feather like you've got the primaries and secondaries and it's just how you record that in your documentation it can be a bit of a challenge I suppose. We've got a second interview for this episode actually a couple of weeks ago I was lucky enough to speak with curator David Gelsthorpe from Manchester Museum and we had a good old chat about audience engagement and communicating natural history. So I'm sitting here with David Gelsthorpe of the Manchester Museum. So David, you are curator of Earth Sciences at Manchester Museum, and I've come to talk to you because of your work with visitor outreach. Firstly, thank you very much for speaking to us. My pleasure. And my first question to you is, what first got you interested in going further with outreach? Well, we do brilliant things here at the museum. We've got a fabulous collection. We've got a great exhibition programme. But I think we really wanted, particularly with climate change and all the fundamental issues that are happening on the planet, we really wanted to make a difference. And I think we've got a great mission of understanding between cultures and developing a sustainable world. But a couple of years ago, we kind of sat back and thought, are we really making a difference to people's lives, what they do when they get home from maybe a brilliant museum visit or maybe a less so brilliant museum visit? And do we actually make a difference to climate change, how people behave, how people think about things, how they value the world around them? And with our climate control exhibition a couple of years ago, we set ourselves the challenge of really making a difference. So that was from everything from right before the exhibition even happened. We, we tried very hard to kind of build a buzz around uh, what was happening, getting people thinking about climate change and, and what that meant for museums and people's lives, and really thinking about the exhibition before it even opened, which is something we'd never done before, which was really exciting at the time. And then when we had the exhibition open, we really wanted to kind of capitalise on on what we have that's unique. So we, particularly as a university museum, have fantastic sort of access to amazing cutting-edge research that is happening in Manchester and nowhere else in the world. Uh, And also we have a fabulous collection and and staff here to, to make the most of it. So we kind of very much used some of the best examples that illustrate climate change in Manchester Museum. So we obviously focused on fossil fuels, telling some of the realities of of what fossil fuels are and how they're making an impact on climate, but celebrating how amazing the process is of, of forming fossil fuels, of plants, humble plants, bringing carbon out of the atmosphere and, and really changing the whole planet. Uh, and that's an incredible thing that we should celebrate, that that thing happens in the world and it's amazing. 
but obviously it has an impact on climate mm. change and our atmospheric um, kind of makeup now. And the other side we looked at was um, uh, Arctic animals. We've got a fabulous collection of, of, of really spectacular Arctic animals here at Manchester Museum. And unfortunately, climate change is happening twice as fast in the Arctic. Mm-hmm. So the sun bouncing off the ice usually keeps kind of the temperatures down in the Arctic. But with global warming and a lot of that ice melting, it exposes a lot of the uh, relatively dark coloured uh, land surface. So it warms up that much more quickly uh, and then climate change is happening twice as fast. So instead of overwhelming people and depressing people, we (laughs) really wanted to kind of say we've got amazing animals in the collection from the Arctic. We had a fabulous whale skull, got our beautiful polar bear, which is still on display in the museum arctic fox and all sorts of other amazing things and we wanted people to say the world is a brilliant place with these animals in it and really if you can't get motivated and excited by Mm -hmm. those amazing things what can you get motivated and excited by so we're kind of really trying to appeal to people's values people's goodwill and love for the natural world Uh, but the other thing we were wanting to kind of try and address was Uh, the sense of collective action Mm -hmm. so loads of people do great things recycling on a Tuesday or whatever and um, buying ethical products and things like that but there's a strong sense that I do great things but nobody else really bothers so Mm -hmm. why should I care so we had our amazing black and white wall in the middle of the gallery sounds the simplest thing and it, it was really Um, But on the uh, white side of the wall, uh, next to our Arctic animals, we got people to put a black sticker on the wall. Mm -hmm. And that was to try and give a sense of uh, impact on the world, really. Mm -hmm. And again, a sense that probably each individual person doesn't have a massive impact on the world, but collectively we have a big impact. So over the life of the exhibition, over the six months, the the wall almost entirely filled with these black dots. And on the other side of the wall, we were... Uh, hoping to have uh, moth stickers that were uh, put on the wall to try and um, represent support for climate change Mm -hmm. and support for positive action. But as with a lot of these things, um, they didn't arrive on the day of the opening of the exhibition. So we had to run down to Ryman's, get something that would do for the opening of the exhibition. (laughs) So the obvious thing was uh, these um, sticky back uh, kind of address labels Mm -hmm. that people use for envelopes. And... The most wonderful thing happened because people started writing messages of hope, messages of positive climate Mm -hmm. climate action, and people were responding to what other people had put Mm -hmm. on the wall, and there were genuine, really positive, empowering conversations going Mm -hmm. on, positive, empowering actions, because we were kind of conscious we don't have all the answers at all, we wanted Mm -hmm. people to come up with their own answers. And it was one of those serendipitous moments that just made the whole thing incredibly Mm -hmm. positive. Uh, and I guess the other side we wanted to do with the um, the outreach particularly was the, the social media. So we started with thinking, trying to get people to think about uh, climate in Manchester. Mm-hmm. So what have we been like in the past? Because everybody thinks, oh yeah, it snowed loads more when I was a kid. Yeah. But is that real? Is that not? But not necessarily a scientific thing, but trying to get people to think about... Uh, their memories and their their kind of appreciation of things. Not so many people got involved with that, but the genius thing that did work incredibly well was polar bear and penguin selfies. Mm-hmm. It sounds the <laughs> silliest thing, but we've had massive success with dinosaur selfies at Manchester mm-hmm. Museum. It's obviously it's hashtag any museum or yeah. anywhere in the world can can use, but we put a really simple prompt graphic on our our stand. The T Rex said. When you've taken your picture with a dinosaur, please share it with Manchester mm-hmm. Museum. And now, vast majority of the photographs on the hashtag Dino Selfie are Manchester Museum, mm-hmm. which is brilliant. So we kind of thought, mm, how can we capitalise on that really lovely thing that people are celebrating their nice day out and looking at yeah. the lovely collections? So I thought, well, the obvious thing is polar bears mm-hmm. and penguins. So we've got a fabulous uh, giant emperor penguin. That's mostly the height of a four or five year old, so wow. it works perfectly well. <laughs> and our really iconic polar bear. So we just again put a graphic up saying, "Show your support for action on climate change by taking a polar bear or penguin selfie," mm-hmm. and have the hashtag for the exhibition, which is still up there. If you, if you want to go to our, our nature's library gallery and, and have a go yourself, really. So you've talked a lot about um, your work with communicating climate change. What do you think of the uh, place of museums in the conversation about huge topics like this? I think it's a really interesting place museums have and a really unique place, actually, because 
as I previously said, we, we're in a really unique position where we can achieve things that mm-hmm. other people can't. We, we shouldn't be doing things you can do in a community centre. Mm-hmm. We, we have amazing objects, amazing staff, and amazing access to incredible people. So I think we're the only place where these can come together, where you can talk about real objects, real issues mm-hmm. uh, with real people. And when we did our climate control exhibition, for example, we had climate conversations every day of the exhibition, which was amazing. So... I ran quite a few of them, just chatting to people about what they thought, uh, what their experiences were, what their worries were, what their opportunities were. Mm-hmm. But we also had other brilliant people like world-class researchers, Friends of the Earth, all sorts of other people like RSPB who were interested. And we invited anybody to come and have these conversations. Um, but I think the other thing is museums are in a very unique position. We're a trusted institution, which... Yeah a lot of places don't do not have public trust anymore Mm -hmm. and we're a safe space for debate uh, and discussion and questioning things Um, we tried very hard not to shy away from difficult conversations Mm -hmm. I mean not that we particularly had anybody who was challenging what we were saying about climate change but obviously some people know more than others and we don't ever want people to feel stupid Mm -hmm. any anybody can ask any question at any stage Uh, and Hopefully it was didn't take away from people just having a nice time, mm-hmm. but was something really meaningful that actually hopefully made a difference to the world and, and hopefully has a legacy as well. Brilliant. Yeah. That sounds like such a great mm. attitude and a brilliant mm. set of projects. Mm. So thinking more generally, what kind of advice would you give people wanting to display natural history collections in general or science collections, um, but, that, but are not quite sure how to make it a relatable topic? Sure. Um, I think my first kind of approach would be make it relevant, interesting and exciting. So I think we've been through quite a long journey here at Manchester Mm -hmm. Museum. I've been here nearly 12 years now. And when I started, we had a set of galleries that were designed for undergraduate teaching. (laughs) Even though the vast majority of our audiences, family audiences, coming out to have a nice time at half term or or whatever. Um, So there are loads of technical terms. I'd never even heard of, and I've got a PhD, so I don't know how, what our visitors thought. Um, but originally, particularly our mammals gallery, and to an extent our birds gallery, was very much nature is something that happens to other people on the other side of the right. world. And with our living worlds gallery, which uh, evolved from our mammals gallery, we very much wanted to put people back into nature. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we cover everything from weather to symbols to... Uh, how things are portrayed in things like Disney films and things like that. So a really nice ways into people relating to and identifying with nature. Mm -hmm. And then uh, what was our birds gallery, we transformed into a gallery called Nature's Library. So that was uh, really trying to celebrate the diversity and abundance of amazing encyclopedic museum collections, Mm -hmm. which is uh, what we have here in Manchester. Uh, But it was also really focusing on how the collection's used and why we mm-hmm. need a big collection. So uh, our displays are only a tiny part of what we do of here course. at Manchester Museum. So there's all university teaching, obviously a lot of uh, research. Uh, we do lots of publicity, outreach, learning, a whole myriad of a range mm-hmm. of things and fabulous work with artists, which have been some brilliant projects over the years. So we really tried to bring that out. So a nice example is um, we've got a really big collection of, of peregrine falcons, for example. So the average person off the street would say, why have you got 40, 50 of the same thing? Yeah. Uh, well, the answer is that basically they uh, were all collected at different time periods. Mm-hmm. So by looking at the chemicals within the feathers, for example, you can look at pollution over time. Yeah. Uh, so you need a big collection with repeated examples of the same thing over mm-hmm. time. Uh, to uh, give a really good understanding of a, a scientific research project. Brilliant, and I imagine that really encourages people to think about research in relevant and, and now usability. Hopefully, absolutely, yeah. Because one of the things with natural history collections is there's incredible collections all over the country, often at tiny museums mm-hmm, and yeah. in the way you wouldn't expect it at all. And by raising the profile of these amazing things, we can get them used and meaningful to society and fundamentally change the world and change people's lives, which is really exciting. So you mentioned briefly just now um, your audiences and um, the, 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 the scope of different people that your audiences are. What do you think your most keen audience is? 
I think it's different for different types of collections. So one of my favourite projects we've had in the last year or so is we had a dinosaur, a genuine real dinosaur, Mm -hmm. that was on display probably about 10 or 15 years ago for various reasons, mostly conservation reasons. It was taken (laughs) taken off its mount. We understand that it's on this show. (laughs) Well, hideous stories of superglue binding the bones together. Anyway, yeah. So that was uh, disarticulated. We we had circular saws going off its hideous metal mount and all that kind of thing. So it's been pretty much sat in... um, in the drawers of the geology department at the university been used for some lovely student projects Mm -hmm. but really we've kind of been waiting for the opportunity to do something really exciting with it fundamentally put it back on display as well so we've had a great bunch of really keen geology students who've set up their own dinosaur club Mm -hmm. uh adorable exactly you can't (laughs) do anything but love them for it so they they're really keen to do some real geology real curating Mm -hmm. and real museum work so we've been working really closely with them entirely led by them Mm -hmm. but they've been numbering everything they've done fabulous work scanning it all Mm -hmm. they've published little papers and and they're doing basically all the curatorial work Mm -hmm. and they're massively excited about it they can't tell everybody how amazing it is Mm -hmm. (laughs) they just totally love it and it's a win-win for everybody so hopefully down the line we might even do a a crowdfunding project with them as well Mm -hmm. and it be a great kind of selling point that it's the student engagement project and they're getting employability skills Mm -hmm. out of it and there's a um, an end point which is a public outcome mm-hmm. who is the most what kind of audience is the most readily won over from being disinterested good question I think it's quite relevant in terms of climate change discussions mm-hmm. and, and that kind of context because we have a brilliant regular audience a lot of repeat visits we've got about 500,000 mm-hmm. visitors a year and I wouldn't say they're disinterested at all, Mm -hmm. but perhaps don't have a very thorough understanding of what the issues are. So I would say our our regular keen audience who love to bring their grandkids Mm -hmm. on half term or whatever, they're very receptive to all the great things we're doing. Um, I think it's, it's very, very difficult to persuade somebody who has a strong opposing opinion. So for example, climate change deniers though they are a tiny, tiny proportion mm-hmm. of the whole audience, I think it's you're almost wasting your time trying to target right. an audience because they have very fixed, firm I views. Yeah. Um, so I think it's trying to focus on um, people who are receptive and open to other ways of thinking. I think mm-hmm. that's, that's yeah. the, the most straightforward and achievable yeah. thing. Yeah. Great. So finally... You've told us about some really fantastic and hugely successful projects that you've worked on and that you've presented um, and that you've encouraged in others. What have you tried that has been less successful or that needs further work in the years you've been here? I guess it's getting a profile for the stored collection is is sometimes quite challenging Mm -hmm. because, as I previously said, most people just think we have displays and we don't have anything in store or... Alternatively, some people think we have a massive warehouse full of dinosaurs, which Keeping unfortunately we don't. <laughs> no. um, so I think a lot of it is word of mouth, particularly with researchers, mm-hmm. knowing that we have this big collection, yeah. published catalogues and all the rest. But a lot of it is uh, getting the message out that we're open for business and we really want the collection mm-hmm. used, which I don't think has necessarily always been the case in the past. Uh, but a brilliant project that we've worked really well on for the last couple of years and launched earlier this year was uh, our Citizen Science Collections project. Yeah. So, to be honest, some of our collections documentation is a bit of a mess. We have yeah. <laughs> no records or more than one record for the same object. And anyway, it's the listeners bit... will be nodding <laughs> along. <laughs> As you can imagine, it, yeah. we've got 250,000 fossils and wow. trying to get one record for each object with all yeah. of this on a searchable database mm-hmm. online and all the rest. Um, but rather than see it as a massive problem, we've tried to see it as an opportunity, actually, Mm -hmm. which has been really liberating. So we've had a a programme of a big team of volunteers photographing thousands of our fossils with Mm -hmm. the labels. And then we've worked with uh, um, a website called Zooniverse to put Mm -hmm. it on an online citizen science uh, project called Reading Nature's Lab, Mm -hmm. if you want to have a look. Uh, And we've had literally thousands and thousands and thousands of of volunteers from around the world Mm -hmm. recording the information off our labels onto our our database, which we're now working with a student project to import that back into our database. But um, originally I was kind of thinking, oh, well, it's 
it's a project to get the information off the collection onto an online database for researchers. Mm -hmm. But actually, what I found really exciting and really liberating is that it's a project that says to the world and our wonderful volunteers from around the world, we've got amazing collection. Isn't it fantastic? Isn't the world an amazing yeah. place? So these thousands of people have been so excited that they can join mm -hmm. in the museum and contribute meaningful things and really give a brilliant profile to our, on our, our kind of hidden stored collections. So it's been really liberating and really exciting and hopefully it will carry on with different collections across the museum. Great. Mm. Thank you very much, David, for speaking to The C Word. My pleasure. I found him really, really interesting to talk to. He had such a kind of yeah. positive attitude, positive can-do attitude to loads of different bits of communication. It's nice to get that insight into that side of things. Yeah. You know, like, and what audiences want, because mm -hmm. he was quite clued up on like, you know, who his audience was. And, and I love that he also said that, you know, like families and like young people get very inspired yeah. by these sorts of things. And yeah, I just find that really interesting. I mean, who who would you say comes to your museum, Natalie? Oh, we've we've got such a diverse range. Like, obviously, we're super popular with um, families, mm. like most natural history museums are. Yeah, but we've also got quite a a big adult audience as well. And that reminds me of something that I've been reading. So there are two little books that I've been reading. One is called Seven Million Wonders, and another one is called Unexpected Encounters. And both <laughs> of them are different groups of museums. Uh, kind of coming together and talking about how their uh, natural history collections can be useful and how they can be relevant today and what people can do with them. And uh, the, particularly the Unexpected Encounters one dealt with how to engage with an older audience, so elderly oh, right. people, That's cool. and how to improve their well-being by bringing nature to them and engaging them with natural history. I know it's so full of examples that you you could take away and be inspired by and so they're really really good and I'll pop up a couple of links to those in the in the show notes because those were really really interesting and I just loved it I would really encourage people out there if you have natural history to look after it and use it so thank you so much Natalie for joining us today thank you thanks for having me For this episode, I'm reviewing Dies from Nature by Rico Rasanen, Angie Prometa, and, and Kirsi Ninimeki. This was originally published in Finnish in 2015 and then by Archetype in 2016. And it is gorgeous. In appearance, it puts me in mind of a coffee table art book, quite large format with beautiful arty photos throughout. The authors are a professor in craft science and textiles, a professor in textile art and design, and a horticulturalist PhD. So no, this book is not a conservation-specific book, nor is it really emphasising historic examples of dye use. But I'm reviewing it here because I can't think of any conservator I know who wouldn't find something interesting here. All images are based around plants, textiles and yarn, natural fibres, gardens, the great outdoors... It feels like vegetable patches, wellington boots and spinning wheels. Those of us who aren't involved in these sorts of extracurricular activities will have worked with conservatives who have. We can't seem to get away from it. After some really lovely photographs of yarn, we start strong with a family favourite, the history of natural dye stuffs. This section is a brief overview of dye types and their use around the world. There are other pieces of historic information at the start of other chapters later on, but in general there is not much depth to be useful to the conservator using this book for reference. What it does provide is a potted history of specific colours derived from nature, and I would think that we would head elsewhere for initial dye history research than this book. Section 1, Sources of Colourance, presents each colour separately with colour-coded tabs for easy browsing. These are mini essays on each plant or fungi, illustrated with botanical drawings and large photographs of the plant, and textile appearance of the dye. These essays cover history, dye result, and tips for identification when gathering, as well as additional facts such as use and toxicity. The essays are well balanced in length for readability and well referenced. Section 2, Dyeing and Fabric Printing. This is where it starts to get practical. Starting with textile preparation and mordanting, 
complete with molecular diagrams. In a useful tips chapter, we are given dye recipes, step-by-step instructions against helpful photographs of the steps, and dyed textile examples of what you would expect to achieve from the process. I was surprised by this and really pleased. It's definitely targeted at the craft audience, but with the history, science and botany, seeks to provide a historic understanding of the processes. The following chapter in this section is fabric printing with natural dye stuffs. And I was particularly keen on this section as it's not something I'm familiar with at all. It continues in the same way with instructions on how to create the correct pastes and building on what has already been covered. Section 3 is called Dye Stuff Technology. In this section, arty fashionable photographs are replaced with diagrams and molecular formula. The majority of the science in this book seems to have been compressed into this section, and this has the result of having a a doing half and a thinking half of the book. In practice, this allows the reader to breeze through instructions and histories without needing to encounter science until it is looked for. I think this format has allowed them to cover more and in greater technical detail than perhaps would have been allowed if it was interspersed. This is great news for us. Though extensive and technical, the straightforward format breaks down the key topics in manageable sections, easily organised and very accessibly written. I particularly enjoyed the explanation of textile types with diagrams. This can be understood whether or not the reader has a background in science. At the end is a chapter on the characteristics of natural dye stuffs in textiles that describes and explains things like colour fastness, pH and UV absorption. Although very much not directed at conservation audience, there are some very interesting and helpful things in this section, especially with the UV. This is a beautiful and very pleasing practical guide for enthusiasts of related crafts and aims to provide the science, biology and basic manual skills to take part in the practical process of dyeing with natural dye stuffs. For the conservation audience, this book is of interest, not necessarily to replicate outside of our various craft hobbies, but to understand the sorts of processes required to achieve particular colours and effects. As a book, it is beautiful. As a resource, it is interesting. As a conservation audience, in whatever specialism, we are always mindful of the value of learning traditional skills and techniques to understand our objects and better our profession. If you'd like to get hold of a copy, it is on Amazon for just under £49 or from the publisher at £50. Dear Jane, what does one do with a large amount of, quotes, unknown specimens in a collection? I have no biology knowledge whatsoever and nor do the collection staff, but here I am drowning in unlabeled birds and lost butterflies. What do you suggest? From Perpetually Embarrassed Conservator. Dear Perpetually Embarrassed, when it comes to collections and not knowing what they are, you're not alone. Even though my background is, tends to be in archaeology, if someone passes me a bit of um, orangey ceramic pottery, unless it has Ikea written on it, I probably couldn't tell you what the date was. We can't know the dates, the cost, the manufacturing details of every single item from the whole of history and natural science. So try not to worry about it. That said, if you have a large collection of natural sciences, there are some things that you should be worrying about, not least your health and safety. When you're looking at health and safety, you have to think about what those collections have been treated with. So, if you have any reason to believe that your collections have been around for sort of 20, 30, 40 years or more, then you have to assume that they've been treated with pesticides. Wear gloves, wear face masks, try not to do any cleaning and dusting without safety precautions. I'm sure you know it. I think what's interesting about this is it brings up the question of disassociation, probably the least discussed of the agents of deterioration, one that I think we should give far more attention to in conservation. So what can you do? Well, if you had one or two items of natural science that you didn't know, I would suggest some kind of crowdfunding approach, you know, a a Twitter account saying, you know, reunite the tweet with the bird. But if it's a whole collection, then this is a problem because we can't undermine the professional work of colleagues, natural science curators, natural science expertise. It's an area of a profession that we should respect. So realistically, it sounds like you need some professional input. And the only way to do that is to find some money. Looking around for grants, then you might be able to use the issues of DNA, the relationship of people in the countryside, to make this a topical issue that you can help collect on. 
I know, for example, that Esme Furban Fund in the UK have supported grants for rationalisation of collections, for example, in Wales, was in the natural sciences with the stuffed, pickled and pained collections project. I can't obviously guarantee that you'll get money, but that would be the only sensible suggestion in terms of identifying the whole collection. And you never really know what's in a natural science collection. You don't know how rare or how important and how they're going to be used. And I think that that holds true even if you don't at this stage, aren't at this stage able to identify everything. Because like all collections, we hold them in reserve and we don't quite know what's around the corner. Good times and bad times are in the front of us and we don't quite know how that will relate to the collection. I was thinking when I, when I heard your request about a collection of bees in the Bolton Museum. I'm not saying that they weren't identified, but after the Manchester bombings, which happened in the UK last year, the symbol of defiance, of recovery and hope became the bee, the bee of Manchester. And I know that the Bolton Museum did an absolutely beautiful evocative display around bees, using bees from the collection, um, partly in a heart shape, to symbolise and make meaning out of the event and to, to be a place where communities could stop and talk. And to do that, they didn't need to know the Latin name of the bee. It was more about the meaning of the bee at that time and place. And I think it's a real reminder to us that our collections mean different things to us at different times and at different places. So keep your butterflies out of the light. Wear gloves when you handle the dead birds. <laughs> but try to keep them and cherish them until of such time you're absolutely authoritatively able to say that these are not part of the collection, they were never accessioned and that they're easily replaced. But until then, I think like everything else, we always have to see our collections as potential, the wonder that might come out of them in the future. I hope that helps. I'm not sure it does. Very good luck to you. Over and out. If you're enjoying The C Word and would like to support our work, then please consider becoming one of our patrons. For as little as $1 per month, you can help us keep our episodes online and more of them coming. Patreon helps us meet our regular costs for the show, and also to plan ahead so we know roughly how much of a monthly budget we've got. That's super helpful when you're trying to do something special like buy a better microphone or save up to go to a special event. Your support also helps keep us free of advertisements. In return, our supporters get access to our archive of extended episodes, which you can only access on our Patreon page. Yeah, for that $1 a month, you get a little extra audio enjoyment. We've crunched the numbers, and it's about 10% extra content on a regular basis. Well, it's not bad for less than a cup of coffee, eh? If supporting us sounds like something you'd like to do, then head over to patreon.com slash the C word and join our bunch of absolute champions. Welcome to our latest patrons, Hannah and Sophie. Thanks so much for joining us, guys. And that was on comments, questions and corrections. And we just thought that we would tell you a bit about the results of our, a couple of polls that we did after we released the parenthood episode in mid-October. And we got the results back from some of our poll questions. So basically what we did was we asked a couple of questions to those who work in conservation and have kids or are expecting little ones. And we asked them in style of condition report ratings, good, fair <laughs> or poor. The questions we asked were, how would you rate your colleagues and managers react? reaction to your pregnancy or decision to adopt in general this can be fellow conservators but also other museum or heritage professionals you work with 60 percent said good which really i think nice. is nice but bear in mind that one in five said poor so i mean that's not not yeah. great so the next question was how did you feel you were treated when you prepared to go on maternity leave and for the dads how did you feel pe people reacted when you expressed a wish to go on paternity or shared parental leave again 64 percent went good but again nearly one in five said poor which is a shame uh, so there there is certainly a positive experience out there but we need to improve it I think mm -hmm. is what we need yeah. to take away from this. And how did you how did you feel you were treated at your place of work when you returned from maternity or parental leave? This one is mixed. And resumed your regular job duties. And forty percent were good, forty percent were poor, and twenty percent were fair. That it's is either good or bad in this one. It's really this is atrocious. Yeah. Uh, and this is something that we need to work on. I mean, it's not okay to have a shitty experience when you come back. It's not. So we all need to get better at that, whether you're colleagues or supervisors, managers. 
we just need to make this better, guys. That's managers need to um, find a way to make it better. And then we asked uh, a question more generally at everyone. How do you feel your workplace treats employees with children in general, whether you have them or not, uh, from toddlers to teenagers? 43% said good, 36% said fair and 21% said poor. So a mixed bag again, but leaning more towards good and mm-hmm, fair. Mm-hmm. So uh, still room for improvement, certainly. And yeah, I think it's just something to bear in mind that we can really improve this yeah. and that there is a need to improve it. We can do better than this. Mm-hmm. We are better than this, guys. <laughs> we are. Come on. Yeah, museum life is stressful, but at the end of the day, we're pretty much all of us are in it because we love it. And there's absolutely no point in making this sort of thing stressful because we're just trying to live our lives. So anyway, if you have any comments, questions or corrections, we would love to hear from you. Thanks for listening. We're The C Word and you've been listening to Natalie Jones, Chloe Rumsey and me, Jenny Mathiasen. Join us next time for an episode about smut. In the meantime, check out our website at theseaword.show, tweet us at the Seaword Podcast, or simply email us on theseawordpodcast at gmail.com. The intro and outro music is Spring by Didi Music, used under Creative Commons Attribution License. Additional sound effects and music by Callum Robertson. This has been a Wooden Dice production. That's good.